Hey everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Alyssa Newcomb, I'm an NBC News tech reporter, and we are here with Sarah K. Ellis, president and CEO of GLAAD, and YouTube creator Tyler Oakley. You probably know him from his amazing videos. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think we, close to eight million subscribers. Yeah, hi everyone. Good morning. <laughs> morning. <laughs> or afternoon, afternoon. A afternoon. afternoon. So today we are talking about online activism and how it's kind of changing with all of these new tools we have out there. So Sarah Kate, I wanted to ask you, how has GLAAD's uh, strategy evolved with these new platforms and new audiences being reached? Sure. Well, you know, GLAAD was founded 30 years ago and we really were the voice of the LGBTQ community. And now everybody has their own voice, their own platform. So we ha it, it's been very helpful for us in that we don't have to be necessarily the watchdog that we used to be um, because so many people are activists now themselves. What we can do is elevate that and bring it to even a higher platform at that moment when something is happening. But also it's made us look at our at how we are activists and what we have to do in terms of building up our activism and our followers and our, and our members so that when we have something that is that we feel really important and needs to be spoken about we can then go to a body of people and say we've got to get on this and we've been doing a lot of that lately um, we've really shifted lately from everything on calling um, ambassador Nikki Haley to talk about what's going on in Chechnya with the gay concentration camps to releasing video on you know secretary army uh, potential nominee uh, Mark Green and his view on transgender Americans and why he's not fit to serve in that position and really getting our base then to percolate these and fight uh -huh. back and use their platforms then to push it further out. And today German uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel called on Vladimir Putin to denounce what's going on in Chechnya with these concentration camps. And you have a pretty uh, successful tweet out there already today about that. Um, yeah. Can you tell everyone what you said and kind sure. of how you're approaching so that? After we had um, gone to um, Nikki Haley and asked her to speak out about these atrocities, um, then Angela Merkel spoke out about it. And, and so what I decided to do was tweet, I've been tweeting at um, Donald Trump and have to silence, um, which we find on a lot of LGBTQ issues. But um, this time I said, I, I, I called the queen herself, Beyonce, and just said, you know, now we've gotten Nikki to speak out, we've gotten Angela, we know who really runs the world. And, <laughs> and sort of play to that with him on like trying to get him to engage on these atrocities. And Tyler, you have used your YouTube platform for fun, but for also some really important issues. Yeah. What are some of the pieces of content that you're kind of most proud of when it comes to activism? Uh, well, so I make videos on YouTube. I talk about my life. I've been doing it. This is my 10th year, so this has been a minute. Um, and from the start, I never really thought I would be doing social justice work or activism things. It was just for entertainment, but then as my audience grew, I realized that there's a potential, there's an opportunity there, there's a, a moment where I can have these genuine conversations um, and still have fun. And so the, the content that I'm most excited about and most proud of is that stuff. Um, I worked with the Hillary campaign. I would uh, go to swing states and college dorms and go door to door and make videos surprising fans and dragging them to the polls or to register and <laughs> things like that. I think for me, uh, it's finding a, um, an in-between between, between uh, making that content digitally and having real world moments of um, getting out there and talking face to face and while it was uh, started online, having those dialogues in person. Um, so doing that work with the Hillary campaign I think my favorite thing I've ever done, though, was with um, the Obamas. Uh, while um, President Obama was president, uh, he had a, a large little crew of YouTubers come in and talk to him about how to use social media to engage with younger audiences. So um, we had a meeting at the White House with the president, and he was asking us for advice. And to me, that was just 
one of the coolest moments of realizing, like, we actually are doing something um, that is being recognized and is making an impact. And I hoped, more than anything, that my audience would realize that it's not just us, it's us with our audiences, and it's them, and it's, it's because these audiences are so passionate and involved. And more often than not, my audience is younger, and seeing them care and want to get involved locally, if not um, nationally, has been refreshing, uh, especially in the past 100 days. Um, it's been great, yeah. And how important are these personal stories that people have to share when it comes to you know, spreading a message online or trying to get something done or get someone's attention? How, how important is it that you share why something means so much to you personally? Yeah. Uh, well, we were just talking about the power of um, making it personal. And uh, I think that's why so many YouTubers are so successful uh, and, and digital stars really resonate with audiences is because it's not scripted, it's not planned often, and it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one connection. It feels like a friend that you're watching intimately at, alone on your computer as opposed to on a big screen or with friends in your living room. It feels like a personal touch. And so to hear those stories and to have them resonate, whether it's somebody like Gigi Gorgeous who talks about her transition openly, um, and uh, especially in her new documentary, it's, it's seeing those stories and feeling a connection to them uh, more often than not will m have a direct impact on how they speak up as activists, how they vote. Mm -hmm. um, if you know somebody, it feels more personal. Mm -hmm. And GLAD has had a lot of success, especially recently. Mm -hmm. um, you managed to get the rating change for the movie Th Three Generations mm -hmm. um, to a PG-13, which yes. is great. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, what makes a campaign successful? Is there one secret ingredient that we should know about? Uh, I wish there were one secret <laughs> ingredient. It always feels like a war room when we have a campaign going on. Um, but I, I think what's really important is that, uh, from a personal standpoint, is that we know at GLAD, it's been our secret to success, is that when you know someone who's LGBTQ, it makes it harder to hate them. When you know someone's personal story, whether they are really far right or really far left or somewhere in between or fair-minded or not so fair-minded, is that when you know someone's story, we all have struggles and we all have a personal story. When we share those personal stories, they're connectors. And that's what we need right now is unification in this country. And so, you know, with the PG-13 rating on three generations, this is a movie that's opening um, this coming weekend. It's a Harvey Weinstein production. It has um, Elle Fanning in it, Sarah Sarandon, uh, Susan Sarandon, and um, Emma Watson. And it is the story of a teenage trans young person who is transitioning. And our fight was that this story needs to be told to so many people. The widest audience is, is the imperative here. And so we really went to town working. What we did was we, we started a petition that got over 35,000 signatures um, and worked with the MPAA who issues the ratings and talked them through why it's so important that this is open to as many audience, as big an audience as possible. Mm -hmm. Because this is the first time that a trans teenager story is being told on the big screen. And we wanted to make sure that as many mm -hmm. people could see it. Both families who have trans people, but people, especially people who don't have trans people, because when you, you know, before Caitlyn Jenner came out, only 3% of Americans said that they knew someone who was trans. Mm -hmm. And we worked very intimately with Diane Sawyer on that whole coming out story behind the scenes, because we knew that it was the largest platform ever for a trans story, and that America for the first, many Americans for the first time, here in America and globally actually, mm -hmm. we're gonna meet someone who is trans for the first time. And that's the work that we do, and that's mm -hmm. why it's so important. And what would you say to a lot of people who, especially right now in this incredibly heated political environment, mm -hmm. 100 days into the Trump administration, what would you say to young people who want to get involved but don't quite know where to get started? Mm. Sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> we both have answers yeah. for this, I think. Fabulous. One is, I think, um, one step forward. Sharing your story 
it, and everyone has a platform to do that is so critical. But also, you can sign up for GLAD.org. There are many, many organizations across the country. Find what you're passionate and interested in and sign up for it and participate in it. But also use your own platform. And we're wearing these pins today. These are um, about a United campaign that we're running at GLAD because I think that not only do we have to fight for marginalized groups, but we really have to talk to each other as Americans and find that connectiveness. And this is really about all marginalized groups coming together to protect each other, but also all Americans coming together to protect each other. Um, and so I think that you can get involved. There are so many entry points. Just one little step um, can really start the ball rolling. Yeah, I mean, I think so much happens locally and personally. Having difficult conversations with your friends, with your family. Mm. Um, I learn so much from the internet, and I, I, I see these young people on Tumblr or on Twitter talking about intersectionality, talking about all these topics that I didn't know about when I was in high school. I didn't even know about <laughs> when I was in college. And to see those conversations happening so frankly and openly is so inspiring to me. So just like you said, where everyone has an opportunity to have their platform, whether that's on YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, whatever, making sure that you are joining the conversation, but just as much that also listening. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel like I come from a certain perspective as a white, gay, cisgender man, and there's so much I can learn from other perspectives without having to talk. I think just listening to those dialogues, listening to those conversations and making sure that I'm conscious about what my timeline is giving me. I can so easily just follow other white, gay, cisgender men, but is that actually going to teach me anything other than what I already might know? And so being conscious about making sure that I'm including people of color on my Twitter timeline and Tumblr timeline that are having conversations that I don't think I can have any authority to speak on, but I have definite obligation in my mind to listen to um, and to hopefully amplify to my own audience. Um, making sure you're listening, making sure you're having those dialogues, and making sure that you're putting yourself out there. Um, and one of the coolest things, sorry, uh, that you guys do is work with young people um, to become ambassadors. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so many opportunities for young people to get involved, whether that's uh, with GLAD, Listen, HRC, Trevor, um, those are just my faves because I have a very specific interest. Uh, but organizations, no matter what you're um, interested in, they are gonna want to work with younger people yeah. because they want to foster those voices and help them realize their potential. So getting involved locally at your school, at your college, in your family, it's, it's brave, but it's important. Yeah. And I'll just say to that point, we just did a research study that landed on the cover of Time magazine this past couple, about a month ago, on youth that looked at how youth today identify. And what I find so fascinating, I'm 45 years old, when I was growing up, being different was seen as bad. You were always trying to assimilate and be like everybody else. But today, you see being different as good. And 20% of millennials in our study identify as LGBTQ, which is pretty staggering. So when you look at the future, and one thing that we didn't print, that we had done a study on Gen Zers, and that wasn't in this article, but 60% of them don't identify as strictly heterosexual. So this next generation that we're looking at doesn't want to be checking a box or living on a binary. And I think that businesses, in order to stay relevant and ahead of the curve, really have to take notice of this mm -hmm. and change the way that they're thinking and that the way they're inter intersecting and interacting with their consumers. Because this group of kids, especially uh, the Gen Zers, in 2020 are going to be 40% of the consumer population. That's a lot of money. And to that point, do you feel like, you know, our lawmakers, our companies, uh, is the media, like, are we all listening when people have something to say on the social platforms? Is there something we could all be doing better there, perhaps? Mm. <laughs> I, I mean, there's things that can be improved, always. <laughs> um, I think the best way to improve it is for each of us individually to recognize that they work for us in a lot of ways. Uh, whether that's politicians who have to listen to their constituents. Um, more often than not, I would imagine people that are maybe oppressive 
um, could be more outspoken. So making sure that your voice is heard uh, about who you are and what you want your constituents to, or I mean, what you want your politicians to do is so important in making those calls, tweeting them, emailing them, writing them letters. Um, I, I know that my audience, at least, is so fired up about getting involved, but they don't know how. So just making sure that you are recognizing that you can hold these people accountable. Um, and I was hearing from social media influencers before I was hearing from the media about Chechnya. And I think because that was starting and because that was bubbling and because organizations like GLAAD were making sure we were talking about it, that's what's going to force media to discuss it and to actually take, uh, pay attention. Yeah. Um, and Sarah Kate, I've always been impressed that GLAAD is able to take a piece of content that's happening in real time almost and quickly turn it around. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a Tennessee lawmaker who made a comment about uh, LGBTQ people as parents recently, and you were able to share that clip and get it out there. How important is Twitter to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? It's incredibly important. It's essential. I mean, social platforms and digital are incredibly important now because it's where a story starts, honestly. Um, and especially nowadays where cable news and nightly news has become Trump TV and is really controlled by the White House and, and, and how he manipulates the media, trying to break through that clutter is incredibly hard. So with the Chechnya incident, actually, is where we started that and percolated that story because we couldn't get CNN or MSNBC to cover this topic was on social media and getting influencers to talk about it, getting, getting regular everyday people to talk about it and say this isn't cool, this isn't right, we need to act as a country, as a world leader. And so eventually once we were able to get Nikki to speak out, that's when CNN actually went behind the scenes and did a story on what was going on there. And so it's sort of the reverse effect where now what happens on social bubbles up to the national, whereas before people on social media would talk about what's happening at the national level, and it's a reverse effect now. And we were talking beforehand about how important local news is to uh, what you're doing. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. I, you know, I think one thing that that we realize in this country is that, you know, we're a media organization, media advocacy organization at GLAAD, and so you can literally look at what shows people watch on TV and know, and they are, they are you can tell who they voted for mm. by the shows they watch. And so what we also realized very quickly was that the local media has been underrepresented, under thought through, and that that is where people are really getting their stories and are still turning on a daily basis. They might have blocked out national news, but they are turning to their local media. And so we've been working very closely. There are some, there have been over 170 anti-LGBTQ bills in this last latest legislative session, and we've been working on the local level to defeat them. So in Texas, in Tennessee, there have been these slate, we are calling them the slate of hate, up to six bills in each of these states. And where we've been rallying our, our campus ambassadors, holding rallies on the campus, and then getting the local press there, and then having them pressure the politicians to vote against these bills has been incredibly effective. And a lot of times, you know, social is so great because everyone has a platform, but sometimes it can create a lot of noise. Do you have any advice for how do we cut through that? Mm. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it is, it is so oversaturated. Um, I think the best piece of advice I could ever give anybody that wants to break through that is realize that you have a very unique point of view. You have a, a point of view that nobody else can give. And um, I guess speaking to your own story, uh, because that's going to be the one of a kind thing. And when you talk about why something's important, period, that might not resonate, but why it's important to you, somebody might connect with that. Or when they hear maybe your background or what happened to you at your job or things like that, I think are, are a much better way to connect yeah. um, and to get people to actually care than if you just say, this is important, care about this. Right. And
And seeing as this is a technology conference, I have to ask, are there any platforms in the future? Uh, might we see VR activism? Oh, God. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> that would be fun. You could march on Washington right in your living room. <laughs> Just put on your glasses. I would prefer if they got up, though, yeah. and get out there. Um, who knows? That's, that is so interesting. I mean, I would ask you guys. I, you're the creators. Um, but I think no matter what the platform, no matter what the new iteration comes out, what's really critical and we know is most effective in activism is, is the personal connection, is the personal story. And there's no feeling that can be recreated as if you showed up in Washington, D.C. or mm. one of the big marches mm -hmm. back in January. Um, and that, that coming together of community. Um, I think, you know, social platforms are a wonderful tool. Nothing will replace the personal and the connectiveness of mm -hmm. activism. And really, at the, at the essence of that is a personal story, is someone who is living a truth that is marginalized and, and we're there to fight for them. I think a cool thing that could happen uh, with something like VR is an opportunity to see in person, in a way, places that we feel disconnected from. Sure. So if something yeah. is happening on the other side of the world, VR might give us an opportunity to see firsthand that. Or even people that might be disabled, being able to experience, experience being involved in ways that they wouldn't have been able to before. Um, but to me, social media is something like that, where you are able to connect with those people across the world. Um, and it's already happening right now uh, in ways like Chechnya, where you can see it. Uh, I think that the challenge is wanting to see it and making sure people know that this is happening and you should care. Right. And I, I think yeah. VR also gives the opportunity to experience what you were saying, is experience the world through the lens of someone who's marginalized. If you walked into a store as a person of color, what that experience is. So you can actually try privilege on for size and, and see what stripping your privilege away looks like or feels like in real time. So I, I think that could really bring, one of the things that we need most in this country right now is empathy. And I think that that could be a, a, a marvelous vehicle for empathy. And speaking of empathy and looking toward the future, where do we go from here? I think, you know, I feel very strongly we have two, two paths um, and we have to double dual track this is that we need to re continue to resist and use our social platforms to call out the administration or anything that we see that um, is that, that hurts marginalized groups in this country. And the other piece of it is that we do need to unify. We have to find common ground, um, and we have to look, dig deep to do that. Um, because we do have more in common than we think we do, and, and we have to call on that, I think, in the future. I would say um, recognize your power. I think that's the number one thing I would ever want anybody to come away from listening to me or talking to me is to realize that they can make a change as just one person. It's not the people with millions of followers or subscribers or whatever. It's sometimes local. It's sometimes having that one-on-one -on -one conversation that's going to make a huge change. Um, and whether that's changing policy in your organization, being conscious of how people are listening or are talking at your job or at your college or at your dorm or whatever, um, those things shape how people approach the world afterward. So when you graduate college, you take what you learned in your dorms, and if your dorm was inclusive and your dorm highlighted you know, diverse voices, you're gonna take that to your job. And so starting early and making sure that locally and within our communities we're thinking about those things, not, that will change the world, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that is all the time we have today. Uh, thank you everyone so much for coming, and thank you Sarah Kate and Tyler. Yes, of course. Great discussion. Thanks, Thanks for everyone. having us. Thank you. We Thanks, appreciate friends. it.